Now you've likely heard in recent days that there's a profound economic, political and social crisis playing out in Venezuela, a country located in South America with a population of more than 30 million people and the world's largest known oil reserves. That's because on January the 23rd, the United States recognised Juan Guaido, the leader of the country's national legislature, as the country's rightful president, while they called on Nicolas Maduro, who won elections in 2013 and 2018, to step down. Yesterday, in solidarity with the Venezuelan people, and out of respect for Venezuelan democracy, the United States proudly recognised National Assembly President Juan Guaido as the interim president of Venezuela. The time for debate is done. The regime of former President Nicolas Maduro is illegitimate. His regime is morally bankrupt. It's economically incompetent. And it is profoundly corrupt. They were quickly followed by the likes of Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, a host of other countries across the Western Hemisphere in calling for profound change in Venezuela. The following day, the Europeans, particularly Britain, Spain, France and Germany, while not following the path laid out by Washington, said that they no longer recognised Maduro as the rightful president either, and that, should he not call fresh elections in the following eight days, they too would anoint Guaido as the country's rightful head of state. The EU strongly calls for the urgent holding of free, transparent and credible presidential elections in accordance with internationally democratic standards and the Venezuelan constitutional order. In the absence of an announcement on the organization of fresh elections with the necessary guarantees over the next days, the EU will take further actions, including on the issue of recognition of the country's leadership in line with Article 233 of the Venezuelan Constitution. Now, why is the situation in Venezuela so important? Why does it matter? Well, as I've already said, the country has the world's largest known oil reserves, making it a key point in terms of geopolitical and energy interests. Secondly, it's often used as a way of admonishing the left. Even if you're trying to lambast and undermine somebody simply asking for a living wage or remotely social democratic politics, the answer seems to be Venezuela. But, uh, I mean, my God, this is uh, another story. It's a once wealthy so uh, country ruined by socialism. It takes a special kind of socialist incompetence to turn a country with the largest proven oil reserves in the world into one where 90% of the population live in poverty. The problem in Venezuela is not that socialism has been poorly implemented, but that socialism has been faithfully implemented. Now that's the foundational myth that much of the right uses to admonish Venezuela and, by extension, the left. They say it was once a very wealthy country, making the most of its profound and abundant natural resources, and that economic mismanagement by a socialist government has led it to a path of poverty and degradation. Except that's not quite true, because when Hugo Chavez was elected as a result of democratic elections in 1998, the country he inherited was in a parlous situation. In fact, GDP per capita in the country in 1998 was at the same level it had been in 1963. And in fact, it had fallen by a third from the all-time high of 1978, 20 years earlier. What's more, the purchasing power of the average salary was one third what it had been 20 years before. Meaning that the situation he inherited was in many ways resembling the economy of Venezuela today. Thus, if we want to make sense of the rise of Hugo Chavez and the popularity of what's been called the Bolivarian Revolution, we have to understand the profound economic crisis into which he stepped. He did not assume the mantle of economic prosperity and success. Anything but. What's more, the first 12 to 14 years of the Bolivarian Revolution, named after Simón de Bolívar, one of the mythical political figures of Latin America in the 19th century, was one of growth and economic expansion. GDP per capita grew by a factor of more than three between 1998 and 2014. The economic success of Venezuela over that period meant it pulled away from similar sized countries in the region, such as Colombia, Peru, and it even became wealthier than Argentina on a per head basis for the first time since 1989. So, in short, the first decade plus 
of the Chavez administration was an economic success story for Venezuela, not the socialist failure we're so often told. More importantly, that economic growth redounded to the benefit of ordinary people, and there was undoubted progress in terms of expanded welfare provision across the country over the first 15 years of the Chavez administration. By 2012, Venezuela had the lowest levels of inequality in the region, with poverty falling from 70.8% in 1996 to 21% in 2010. By the time of Chavez's death in 2013, more than 6% of GDP was spent on education, with citizens enjoying free daycare nurseries and university degrees. While 21% of the population experienced malnourishment in 1998, by 2012 that figure had fallen to just 5%. Elsewhere, infant mortality halved between 1990 and 2010, while the number of doctors relative to the population tripled between 1998 and 2012. Perhaps it's no surprise then, what with its rising, prosperous economy and increasingly far-reaching social welfare programs, that just six years ago, Venezuela was determined to be one of the happiest places to live on Earth. So what changed? Well, the answer to the question can be explained in a single word. Oil. Oil remains the backbone of the Venezuelan economy, which should come as no surprise given it has, as I've already said, the largest known deposits anywhere in the world. 95% of Venezuelan exports are petroleum, and the price of petrol, oil, on the world market determines whether or not the Venezuelan economy goes up or down. That's why if we want to understand the perilous state of the economy that Chavez inherited in 1998, we only need to look at the historically low price a barrel of oil commanded in that period. What's more, Chavez was incredibly lucky. He came to power in 1998, and after 2000, the price of petrol on the world market increased pretty much year on year. So when prices started to go down after 2013, Venezuela had a problem on its hands. It had determined it would use the profound wealth created by its oil exports to create an ever larger social welfare state. And yet, the very commodity allowing that thing to happen was now getting cheaper. Clearly changes had to be made. But it wasn't just the price of oil, or rather its fall, that was the problem. Production of the commodity was also in decline. Falling prices and falling production means one thing and one thing only for the Venezuelan economy collapse. Now many will point to the fact that oil production for the first 10-12 years of the Chavez administration stagnated. But that wasn't because money wasn't being invested into oil production, it was because the price was going up. Chavez in 2000 hosted the first meeting of OPEC, the oil producing countries, in years. And he was very keen to emphasize that their collective power in setting the price of oil on the world market was one that shouldn't be understated. He even compared the price of a barrel of oil to that of wine. So that explains why oil production in the country more or less flatlined when the times were good. But clearly, when you're commanding a lower price, you might need to sell more if you want to make ends meet. The point is, Venezuela has not been able to do that. Why? As this table demonstrates, as recently as early 2017, Venezuelan oil production followed the same pattern as that of Colombia. This clearly changed in August, however, when Trump's new sanctions came into force. As you can see, a decline in production was initially driven by the price of oil hitting its lowest point in about a decade at the start of 2016. But in August 2017, when Trump's sanctions made it illegal for the Venezuelan government to obtain financing from US institutions or individuals, it's clear and apparent that a major shift occurred. This had two major consequences. The first related to the fact that all the Venezuelan government's outstanding foreign currency bonds were subject to New York state law. The second was that because one of the country's major assets, the state-owned Citgo Corporation, was based in Texas, it could no longer send profits and dividends back to Caracas. These had been averaging around $1 billion a year since 2015. So what's the cost of those sanctions been? Well, according to one study, they've cost Venezuela around $6 billion a year, primarily as a result of reduced oil production. $6 billion a year might not sound that much for an American or a Brit. After all, these are multi-trillion dollar economies. But in Venezuela, it's a lot of money. In fact, it's 5% of GDP. It covers the country's entire education or healthcare programs. Then there's hyperinflation, the country is presently experiencing. The rate of inflation in Venezuela last year is meant to have reached 
80,000%. There's a major distinction between high inflation, something Venezuela has always suffered from, and hyperinflation. Generally, hyperinflation is anything beyond 50%. The primary cause of this, it appears, is a massive expansion in the country's money supply, which has been done to cover rising budget deficits, themselves a result of pronounced recession and falling government tax receipts. In essence, the government is printing money, although in the 21st century this is more of a digital undertaking, to finance its own spending, rendering the currency close to worthless. So there is an intimate relationship between the country's economic recession, massive deficits, and hyperinflation. To a significant extent, the depth of each has been profoundly deepened by US sanctions. This is no accident. Indeed, the intention behind them is to starve the country of importing goods and its all-important oil industry accessing the necessary credit to even maintain present production. The United States has pursued a similar strategy with another major oil producer it cannot easily defeat through military means, Iran. While capacity there has held up better than Venezuela and the economy is more resilient after decades of sanctions, Trump walking away from the nuclear deal last year meant Iranian oil exports fell to a five-year low in November. And while Iran is not experiencing hyperinflation, the country's currency, the rial, experienced an 80% devaluation last year. Indeed, the strength of Washington's sanctions against Venezuela and Tehran are reminiscent of those against Nicaragua in the 1980s. Then, as now, they had the desired effect, as the Central American economy went into both recession and hyperinflation. Falling GDP, widening budget deficits, declines in living standards, these aren't a side effect. These are a strategic objective for the United States. As President Richard Nixon put it in 1970, shortly before the US imposed sanctions on Chile, he said he wanted to make the country's economy scream. We're seeing that once more in Venezuela. So that's the economics of the situation in Venezuela and why I think socialism isn't to blame for its present plight. But what about politics? What about democracy? Because that's another means by which Maduro's critics can say the regime has no legitimacy. It is an undemocratic government. We are extremely concerned about the situation in Venezuela. Uh, it is clear that Nicolas Maduro is not the legitimate leader of Venezuela. The election on the 20th of May was deeply flawed. Ballot boxes were stuffed. There were counting irregularities, opposition parties banned. and. Uh, this regime has done untold damage to the people of Venezuela. OK, so a few things here. Firstly, note how Jeremy Hunt, the UK Foreign Secretary, only refers to Maduro and last year's elections being illegitimate. This will be important as we go on. Secondly, and this is really important, he says things which are categorically untrue. So he refers, for instance, to uh, ballot box stuffing. There have been no ballot boxes in Venezuela for a decade, Jeremy. It's done electronically. He also says the major opposition party was banned. Well, how, how are they banned when you're anointing Guaido, who's the leader of the country's legislature? He's obviously contesting an election. In terms of the presidential election last year, they weren't banned, they boycotted it. And that's part of, more broadly, a color revolution strategy with help and advice from the US State Department. We'll talk about that in a minute. I don't see how anyone can believe that Maduro should stay in his position after what he's done to his country. And the only basis that anyone says that he should be there is that he won an election. It was a rigged election. It was a fake election. Uh, the um, uh, Juan Guido uh, is from our sister socialist party. He won an election. He's been recognised by Germany, by France, by Australia, by Canada, by the UK as well. Uh, and he should be given a chance to turn around his country. That's got to be in the interest of the people of Venezuela. Well, we've just had elections and it was the most overwhelming uh, victory in elections which all parties could stand. That's very different from the election of Maduro where not all parties could stand. So one was an election where you had the range of political parties and the other one, the leader of the opposition party was not no, even permitted not to stand in those elections. Not... So that was Rachel Reeves, a Labour MP who's not from the left of the party, perhaps that's quite obvious. She repeated something which Jeremy Hunt said about that being an illegitimate election and the opposition being banned. But they weren't banned. Like I said, they boycotted it. And it is remarkable, isn't it, how the British political establishment and, of course, people in the US, other countries, are saying that every single election in Venezuela is illegitimate except this one election where this one guy was voted in and he's now, by the way, the president. And Rachel Reeves talks about how he 
is in a political party which is in the international umbrella, the same one as the Labour Party. Well, he shouldn't be, because this guy is already making plans in terms of privatising the Venezuelan energy industry. Like I said, it's 50% of Venezuela's GDP, 95% of its exports. He's trying to personally take £1.2 billion worth of Venezuelan wealth from the Bank of England, rather than it going to the Venezuelan Treasury. I mean, isn't that remarkable? He personally wants to take £1.2 billion. How does the, the international, of which the UK Labour Party is a member, feel about that? Is it policy that you start asking for the IMF to come in and ask for advice about how you'll privatise you know, the world's largest known oil reserves? I'd really hope not. It's very important to be cautious in intervening in someone else's country, but Venezuela is a very, very bad problem. There are millions of refugees moving to neighbouring states. Any Venezuelan system is deeply disturbed. The region is deeply disturbed. We're not pinning this on the United States. This is other Latin American countries. This is countries like Canada. This is Germany. This is France. This is Spain. This is the EU. If Britain cannot ally with those people against Iran, Syria, then we're in really serious troubles. This is about a humanitarian move for free, fair elections. That's all this is about. So that's Rory Stewart MP, the Minister for Prisons. He's a Conservative MP. He says that the only kinds of regime now favouring Maduro against the seemingly overwhelming mass of free democratic countries, the US, the UK, countries in the EU, he says it's really limited to places like Syria and Iran. Now, most people listen to that and they go, Syria and Iran, Venezuela must be bad. But hold on a second because that isn't correct. Yes, Syria and Iran recognise the legitimacy of the Maduro regime, as does China, as does Russia. Fine, we might not want to call those liberal democracies. How about India, the world's largest democracy, which says that Maduro should still be recognised as the country's president? How about South Africa? It says the same thing. Apparently that's meant to be one of the most mature democracies in Africa. Post Mandela is meant to be a poster child for how national reconciliation works. They might know a thing about how these kinds of problems can be solved. How about Mexico? One of the world's 12 largest economies, the new president there certainly does not favour regime change in Venezuela. Well, the thing is, none of those countries are mentioned by Western media in terms of who says Maduro should stay. Even when you look at maps, wherever it is, it could be on print or broadcast outlets, showing who's for and against Maduro, who's for and against Guaido. They never show India, they never show South Africa. They rarely show Mexico. So what's going on here? Well, it's fundamentally about priming you in terms of creating a confirmation bias. So you want to agree with him, you want to agree with a nice British politician, and he's saying are the bad people in Syria and Iran. He's not gonna say India and South Africa. You know why? Because that fundamentally undermines his argument. Now I get that, he's a politician, he's going to misrepresent things sometimes. But I find it absolutely despicable that the media in supposedly free and fair countries like Britain and the United States don't show the facts in terms of what countries support what politicians. And every right-thinking member of this House should unite in condemning the Maduro regime and calling for his removal. But once that has happened, we will need significant support for Venezuela in organising free and fair elections. I know the Minister has addressed the point earlier, but will the UK take a lead in ensuring that all necessary global support is given to Venezuela? Because it will be one of the biggest challenges faced by a country coming out of dictatorship for many, many years. Right, Stephanie, and the EU on this? Yeah, I mean, the fact that you see that all the major European countries are coming together and, and uh, saying the same, that Maduro actually has to go. And also you have to... You have to have in to mind, do with them? Well, we have to have in mind that actually the crisis in Venezuela started with Hugo Chavez much before. The first person speaking there is Angela Smith. She's a Labour Party MP, although, as you can probably guess, she's not from the left of the party. Now, there's a subtle difference between what she's saying and what the likes of Rory Stewart, Jeremy Hunt and Rachel Reeves previously said, whereas they had solely disputed the integrity of last year's presidential elections, she's saying, by contrast, that Venezuela has experienced unfreedom, an absence of democracy for many, many years. What's more, the person who follows, a German journalist who writes with Die Welt, says something kind of similar. She says that the crisis didn't start with Maduro, but with Chavez. 
what crisis? Because if it's a crisis of declining GDP as a result of falling oil prices and production, that definitely doesn't start with Chavez. Chavez dies before oil prices start to fall 2013, 2014. Does she mean a crisis of democratic legitimacy? Because one can only presume that is what she means. And as a result, one has to ask, where's the evidence of that? Because Hugo Chavez won four elections between 1998 and 2012, and not a single one was disputed by the US State Department, the Organization for American States, or the Carter Center, an observatory set up by the former US President Jimmy Carter in assessing the integrity of elections around the world. Now, Angela Smith and people like that may not be familiar with the facts. They may just be ignorant about the political history of Venezuela. So here are the facts. Hugo Chavez won his first election in 1998. He defeated Enrico Salas Romer by a million votes. That was viewed as a free and fair election at the time. And even Roma said, quote, I will not only accept the victory of my adversary, but wish him luck, lots of luck, because his luck will be that of Venezuela. Okay, Angela Smith, if you're watching 1998, Hugo Chavez wins a democratic election. As I've already said, the economic conditions which precipitate that aren't that dissimilar to the present moment. But importantly, everybody recognized that he was the legitimate president of the Venezuelan Republic. Now, Hugo Chavez had huge plans for Venezuela, including changing the country's constitution. And that was his right. After all, the mandate he received the previous year was one of national renewal. That happened through a series of referenda in 1999. He only wanted to change the country's constitution with the democratic authority of the electorate. Those changes were ratified. They went through. They changed the relationship of power between various institutions and inserted new features, which one doesn't traditionally consider in democratic constitutions. One is a right of recall, which means that if the electorate gets a number of signatures together, it turned out to be 20%, there could be a trigger ballot, so to speak. I have to emphasize this. Hugo Chavez oversaw constitutional reforms which inserted a right of recall referendum in the presidency itself. That's not really the kind of behavior one would associate with a dictator. Now at this point, and bear in mind this is before 9-11, the US State Department doesn't really know what to make of Chavez. It's certainly not saying he's not the legitimate president. All the major observers are saying both the 1998 election and the subsequent year's referenda on changing the constitution were entirely legitimate. That begins to change, however, in the following few years. In 2000, because you have a changed constitution, he goes back to the polls and says, I want to be president again. He doesn't view himself as being legitimate, given there's been this profound constitutional transformation. He wins his second presidency with an increased majority, this time winning 60% of the national vote, defeating his nearest rival by more than 20%. At the time, the Organization of American States noted, the election campaign was conducted in an overall framework of freedom of expression, pluralism, and a high degree of public participation, fostered by the diversity of candidates, party-backed and independent, and by the efforts of campaigners to mobilize the public at the national as well as the state and municipal levels. Now, his problems with the United States really begin the following year in 2001 where he says in relation to uh, forthcoming intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan that you can't defeat terrorism with terrorism. He was talking, of course, about 9-11 and what he perceived to be a mistaken response by the United States. That alongside an increasingly close relationship between Venezuela and Cuba really got the backup of Washington. And perhaps it was no surprise that despite him winning multiple times between 1998 and 2000, there was an attempted coup with US support against him in 2002. Despite that coup, Chavez was returned to power within 48 hours. That was the result of overwhelming numbers of Venezuelans taking to the streets and demanding he be restored as the country's president. So he's won elections, he's changed the constitution, there's been a coup, and yet he's come back. In between all of that, he inserted, as I've said, that right to recall. Now this is important because two years later in 2004, more than two million signatures are gathered in a petition, 2.4 million was necessary, it was slightly more. And there is a national referendum about whether or not uh, Hugo Chavez should be recalled, in which case there would be a new set of presidential elections. In that vote, Hugo Chavez won 
by 4.9 million votes to 3.5 million. More or less the same margin you see as the 2000 presidential elections. Again, the results of that referendum, as in 1998, as in 1999 and as in 2000, are disputed by next to nobody. 2006, and Hugo Chavez wins his third set of presidential elections. This time he wins by a historic margin. He wins by the largest margin of votes in Venezuelan history, and he wins by the largest percentage since 1947. What's more, turnout is massively up at 72%, the result of a national program of registering poorer Venezuelans to vote. The Carter Center concluded that those elections were fair, transparent, and without serious irregularities. Meanwhile, Thomas Shannon Jr., the United States Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere, was quoted in the Spanish newspaper El País as saying, the political battle that is unfolding within Venezuela is now conducted through democratic institutions. The following year, in 2007, Chavez wants to change the constitution again. He wants to do a bunch of things. He wants to rename Caracas, he wants to bring the voting age down to 16, and he wants to centralize more powers in the presidency. That goes to a popular ballot. And he loses. He loses. So not only does he insert the right to recall in the 1999 constitution, he loses a referendum on changing the constitution once more in 2007. But I thought he was a tyrant who fixed elections. 2012, Hugo Chavez with cancer wins his fourth set of presidential elections. He wins by a margin of more than 10%. Again, nobody disputes the integrity of those elections. The Carter Center said they were the best in the world. So the reality is, with regards to Hugo Chavez, he was one of the most successful politicians in Latin American history. Lula in Brazil maybe tops it, but given the conditions he faced, as well as changing the constitution, there was the right of recall, there was the coup in 2002, his record is remarkable. And between 1998 and 2012, nobody else in national politics could touch him. As we know, however, he died the following year, 2013, which meant the country had to have a fresh set of elections. Now, when a president in the United States dies, as happened with John F. Kennedy, for instance, in the 1960s, the vice president takes over. There are not immediate elections. In the UK, if the prime minister resigns, as was the case with David Cameron or Tony Blair, again, their successor doesn't necessarily have to be elected. I have to say, however, the prime minister in Britain isn't the head of state, but clearly, they administer significant executive functions. And yet in Venezuela, a country which has a right to recall uh, in its constitution, which persists in changing the constitution only through national referenda, you have to have new elections pretty much straight away. It's almost like the democratic standards in Venezuela are, if anything, even higher than they are in Europe and North America. So in the elections that follow, Nicolas Maduro wins, but by a small margin, 1.5%. Perhaps that should come as no surprise. Incumbents tend not to do very well after 15 years in power. Just think of Gordon Brown in the 2010 general election. Yes, he was his own man. Yes, he was a fresh face, but he was heavily associated with Tony Blair, who'd been the prime minister between 1997 and 2007. A similar thing was going on here. What's more, Maduro, for any redeeming qualities he might have as a politician, was no Hugo Chavez. What's more, Maduro won. Now, as I've already said, all of the voting in Venezuela is done electronically and there is a way of auditing the vote. And the 2013 election was audited, 54% of the votes were checked, and it confirmed the overall result of a narrow Maduro victory. Now, the opposition parties said that that wasn't true, it was illegitimate, it was a fake election. Now, guess what? They say that pretty much every year after 2002 and the failed coup. And it has to be mentioned that this opposition is funded to the tune of 5 million US dollars a year. Now that's not a conspiracy theory. This can be found in the publicly available documents of the US State Department. Now, what's really interesting is that foreign nationals or businesses, organizations, aren't allowed to fund politicians and political parties in the United States. Any politician that receives funding knowingly from such actors is actually engaging in criminal activity. And yet, these wonderful pro-democracy parties in Venezuela, being funded to the tune of millions of dollars a year, are doing precisely that. And when you listen to US media, these are supposed to be the beacons of democracy and legitimacy in Venezuelan politics. Well, guess what? I don't buy it. 
Moving forward to last year's elections, when Nicolas Maduro won his second presidency, and of course they are the most important elections in judging whether or not Venezuela has a legitimate democratic government, the opposition weren't banned. They boycotted those elections. And as I've already said, that represents the continuation of a colour revolution strategy. After 2013-14, oil prices were going down. As I've said, this was noted by Washington. Sanctions imposed from 2015 meant oil production simultaneously went down. Oil is 50% of Venezuelan GDP. At the same time, opposition parties, as I've already said, funded to the tune of $5 million a year, began to understand that they couldn't actually defeat uh, the Socialist Party in free, open, democratic elections. Therefore, the best strategy available to them was bring into question the entire legitimacy of the regime. Tell us about the outrage now sparked by this so-called election. Shannon, some horrible scenes on the street there in Caracas, including perhaps the first improvised explosive device that wounded a number of police officers who were on motorcycles. Part of the outrage is a lot of people felt in Venezuela this wasn't an election at all. You couldn't choose to vote no. You could only choose from among candidates that the government had picked for you. This, with the sanctions, it was hoped, would mean a soft coup in Caracas. The only problem with that strategy is that whatever you think of Maduro's popularity in Venezuela, the popularity of the opposition parties is even lower. If you question the political intelligence of people operating at the highest levels of the Venezuelan government, and I don't, well, guess what? The opposition are even worse. Which is why recent events with Guaido uh, represent really a final throw of the dice. We've even now got to the stage where the likes of John Bolton openly admit that the reasons for getting rid of the government in Caracas is about oil and it's about the interests of profit-seeking American multinational companies. So if you think of a company like Sitco, which is owned by PDVSA, which is the state-run oil company there in Venezuela, we have a lot of those Sitco assets right here in the US. Is that something, for example, sir, that you're looking at? Yeah, well, we're in conversation with major American companies now that are either in Venezuela or in the case of Citgo here in the United States. Uh, I think we're trying to get to the same end result here. You know, uh, Venezuela is one of the three countries I call the Troika of tyranny. It'll make a big difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies really invest in and, and produce the oil. Uh, capabilities in uh, Venezuela. It'd be good for the people of Venezuela. It'd be good for the people of the United States. We both have a lot at stake here, making this come out the right way. Now, that's the US. They fund opposition parties. John Bolton talks about, you know, American oil companies going in there. But what about the Europeans? Now, I have to admit, this has surprised me more than anything, perhaps, in this whole sorry episode. As you can see, recent comments by the Prime Minister of Spain are quite clear in denigrating uh, the Maduro government. But one has to ask a question here. Who is the Spanish Prime Minister to question the democratic legitimacy of the Venezuelan government, given events going on in Catalonia? Given the fact that you have a region which has voted in a referendum, yes, it wasn't nationally binding because the national government denied them that, for independence, there is then arrest warrants sent out for uh, politicians now in exile, you have hundreds of people being arrested and injured in protests for Catalan independence. Who the hell is Pedro Sanchez and the Spanish political establishment more generally to say that the Venezuelan government is illegitimate? You can't even recognize the right to self-determination in one of your own regions. Maybe before telling other countries what they can and can't do in their democratic process, guess what, it's not the 16th century anymore and you aren't conquistadors, you could solve problems in your own backyard. Because before talking to Venezuelans about them being denied democracy, talk to Catalans. And then there's Emmanuel Macron, the most unpopular president in modern French political history. At the same time as he was flying over to Egypt to speak alongside President al-Sisi, who won 95% of the popular vote in the last elections in Egypt, he said that goings on in Venezuela were problematic, and that the Venezuelan people deserved free and fair elections. Here's the thing, Macron 
doesn't have to endure a right of recall like the president of Venezuela does. If he did, dare I say it, there would be sufficient signatures for another set of elections in France. He has the lowest popularity ratings ever, 21%. What's more, the yellow jackets, uh, the gilets jaunes, have been subject to appalling police brutality and violence. You've seen tear gas dropped from helicopters on French protesters. People have lost eyes. People have been really badly hurt, incarcerated. And these protests have got so bad, it's now leading to falls in French GDP. So what you're seeing in France is not that different to what you're seeing in Venezuela. Of course, the only difference is they aren't being subject to sanctions by one of the world's largest economies. If they were, you can absolutely guarantee the economic and constitutional crisis in France would be far bigger than what it is in Venezuela. Now, if this was 20 years ago, I would have no doubt that regime change in Venezuela would be coming. It already would have happened. I don't think it will for several reasons. Firstly, the countries of the global north are racked by problems of their own. These aren't just economic, they're also political. As I've said, there are crises of political legitimacy across the world, not just the global south, which means these people can't behave like it's the 19th century anymore. Secondly, the Maduro regime, the Bolivarian revolution, is much more sturdy in Venezuela than foreign observers estimate. And if there was to be regime change, it would, I think inevitably, descend into civil war. My suspicion is there are enough intelligent people on both sides to ensure that doesn't happen. But what you can do, whether you're American, British, French, German, is speak out and speak to your domestic political class. You need to say to them, it is not good enough. In fact, it's shameful for you to be getting behind warmongers like John Bolton, Mike Pompeo and Donald Trump. Nicolas Maduro is the legitimate president of Venezuela. And there is no political solution to this, which looks like CIA-backed regime change.